Good evening. I am Christian Crawforce, moderating tonight's event for the Glaston Abbey Institute. I am happy to welcome you to this evening's second presentation of a series of three on social justice, the church's best kept secret. The Institute is pleased to welcome Father Thomas Massaro of the Society of Jesus, who will help us reflect on the key principles and additional themes that form the foundation of the Catholic social tradition. Father Massario is a professor of moral theology at Fordham University. He also served as at the Weston Jesuit School of Theology in Cambridge, Massachusetts, also Boston College, and the Jesuit School of Theology of Santa Clara, where he also served as dean. He is quite well published with nine books and over 100 published articles on or devoted to Catholic social teachings. You'll see a couple of examples of these books at the end um, that we'll share with you and, and show you some links. Some of his social actions include also services on the Peace Commission of the City of Cambridge, and also as a co-founder and steering committee member of Catholic Scholars for Workers Justice, or Worker, worker Justice. Before I turn the floor over to Father Masario, I will briefly touch on some Zoom meeting format that you should be aware of and some, um, some things that you might follow for a, a more enjoyable and, and informative engagement for tonight. I suspect that Zoom has become more um, familiar with you as it has with me as this world continues to turn forward. Now, as we are in Zoom webinar format, let's briefly review how to use um, the Zoom features tonight. And um, at the conclusion of Father Masario's presentation, there will be a, a question and answer period. Um, so we'll, we'll continue the conversations with that. So if you look at the upper right-hand corner of your screen is the view icon, which I recommend setting to speaker mode. Um, this is actually what I prefer for presentations. At the bottom of your screen is the chat pod, which, despite its name, should be used only if you're having technical problems or issues. And we have Janet ready to assist you if you are having those difficulties. Um, in order to ask a question or make a comment, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Type the question you think of, uh, you think of and then Bonnie will present your question to Father Misario. So forget what I first said in the beginning, just um, so you'll be using the Q&A um, comment area on your Zoom screen. So um, that's it. Um, let's begin. Father Masario, welcome. Thank you very much for that warm introduction. I'm mindful that uh, probably most of our uh, audience tonight was with us last Tuesday, and there's probably some new people as well. So I'm just going to spend about five minutes, just the first five minutes, reviewing what we saw last week and even if you were here, I think you'll uh, it'll be a good refresher for your memory. And if you weren't here, this will be a very quick overview of how we got to uh, the middle part of our series, which is tonight. So I think uh, I opened by explaining that my, my great love for uh, Glastonbury Abbey, I've been there. I spent almost half my adult life in Massachusetts. So I feel like I'm speaking among friends. And I think I proceeded to talk about the fact that Catholic social teaching is part of the church's long tradition of concern for the poor. And of course, the church has been here for 2,000 years. Um, at all times in our history, we've had concern for those with less resources, and we have um, uh, extended a hand of charity to those in needs from the very beginning. I mean, it's, it's the core to the teachings of Jesus. And it's only in the last 130 years since the 1891 uh, encyclical of Pope Leo XIII, it's called Rerum Novarum, only since 1891 has the church been able to say that we have documents that talk to us about the uh, obligation to care for the poor as a matter of justice or social justice, even beyond charity. So they go together, charity and justice, and they're two motivations by which Christians 
uh, reach out to those in need and try to make society a more humane place based on our faith tradition, the words of the of scripture, and our, our tradition over these 2,000 years. So that's a really quick summary of everything that um, has brought us to this point in our church history. And I think I gave a caveat last time, just kind of a reminder that please don't think of Catholic social teaching. We're going to be talking about 15 documents that the church has produced in the last 130 years. Please don't think of them as being providing answers for every question that might ever come up. It's not so much an answer giver as it is a value raiser. So whether you read these documents in their entirety, or you take my word for it in this a webinar, or maybe you read some books uh, written by me or other other experts on Catholic social teaching. Don't expect uh, a you know a complete uh, cut and dried answer to every inquiry that comes up, but do expect Catholic social teaching, the words of popes and uh, congresses of bishops and Second Vatican Council. Expect them to raise your level of awareness of values that are really important as we seek to do justice in the world today. It's part of the social mission of the church, okay? Uh, and I think what, the only uh, uh, prop that I used last time was uh, coincidentally, this series is called um, Our Best Kept Secret. And there is a book called Our Best Kept Secret. It's over 40 years old, and it's produced by uh, the Center of Concern, a Jesuit think tank in Washington. And I have a history with this uh, book. I was, in, I was an intern in that center, and I actually mailed out copies of this book, Our Best Kept Secret. So I'm delighted that somebody, it wasn't me, <laughs> chose this for the title of our three-part webinar. And I think uh, just by way of closing, I'll just, um, uh, in our review, I'll just remind us, where do all these teachings come from? It's not all just sprung up in the mind of a given pope, the sitting pope at the time, who might issue a social teaching document, a social encyclical. Actually, um, the, there are four sources of Catholic social teachings, and I gave them to you last week, and I'll just mention them now. Scripture, that's the Bible. Secondly, tradition, the kind of momentum of teaching upon teaching saints and uh, popes over the time. Uh, the third one is the source of reason. So using the human uh, brain, the, the reason, our rationality to figure out strategies to achieve objectives like social justice, care for the poor, and then experience. We're always updating what we know about social justice based on new data. And that data comes from, oh, I don't know, economics, political science, psychology, sociology, but also from average person's experience on a local level. Try a program out in your parish, see if it works, and maybe adopt that program or alter it. We learn um, through a cycle of experience, and we call that the see, judge, act paradigm. We see a problem, we judge, make some judgments, this would be a good strategy to solve that problem, and then we act upon it. All three of those are crucial parts of the experience part of the four sources. And again, they're scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. Okay, we are at the end of our review, uh, except that I still want to, uh, we're going to go to the next slide here in our uh, slide pack. I just want to mention the six foundational themes that we studied last time. And we spent almost 10 minutes on each of these themes. I'm just gonna barely mention them in a few seconds tonight because these foundational themes will lead us into four further themes, which is what were the main part of today's presentation. So what did we see last week? We saw that the first foundational theme and it's A on the slide in front of you. Uh, and by the way, if that slide is too big or too small, uh, you can you can use your cursor to move, <laughs> uh, put your cursor at the uh, right end of that slide and you can make it bigger, uh, uh, push it down and you can slide that into the bigger position or smaller. It also depends upon how large you want my face to be on your screen. Totally up to you. I, if I were you, I'd recommend the slides being as big as possible. <laughs> okay, so the first of those six themes, the A1, the dignity of every person and human rights. And this is the theme, again, foundational, that recognizes human dignity, the, um, com the um, incalculable worth of every human creature, 
And of course, that we are created in the image of God. We have dignity. God wants us to be respected. And in recent um, uh, decades, uh, really centuries, we've had this notion of human rights. Um, it started as a secular concept from the French Revolution, by the way. It's been in the United Nations document. So 75 years ago this fall, the United Nations uh, accepted, voted on unanimously, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And the Catholic Church has a very wonderful tradition, since then anyway, of respecting human rights, articulating what they mean, the, the long list of, of rights that uh, great popes like John the Twenty Third in his 1963 encyclical, Pacem and Terris, have uh, elucidated for us. So that's the first one. The second one is, let's see the B level there, solidarity, the common good, and participation in society, in the economy, in politics, et cetera. So this is the second theme. And I think you, you could tell right off the bat that this one is a balance or a counterbalance to the first one. If uh, uh, human dignity and human rights might sound a little bit individualistic to some of us sometimes, it's all about me, it's all about my dignity, protect me, uh, look out for number one. It is nicely balanced by the B level here, the second theme, solidarity, which means we all belong to one another, we have obligations. Secondly, the common good, the idea that it's not just about my private interest, that would be the private good or the individual good. Uh, Catholic social teaching is emphasizing the common good. What's good for everyone? Sometimes supporting the common good, advancing the common good demands sacrifice. And so we do things like pay taxes, even though maybe other people benefit a little bit more from those taxes than I might. That's this notion of supporting the common good and pursuing goods that we enjoy in common. Things like, oh, I don't know, clean air and water, uh, parks, national defense and security, uh, infrastructure like roads, things that everyone is expected to contribute to and that we all enjoy and benefit from together. They're not private goods, they're common goods. And the word participation at the end of that second theme is a reminder that everyone has a right to have a say in the way that our political system works, so we have democratic voting, the way our economy works, and so we have uh, you know, shareholder resolutions and labor unions and all kinds of ways that people in the workplace, owners, managers, and simple, regular rank and file employees all should have some say in how the economy unfolds. The third item there is family life. I said last time that the church has long recognized the sacredness of families. The uh, It's called sometimes the domestic church. It's where people get their values. They're socialized in good values and virtues like charity and justice and uh, uh, civility. And uh, the, the church has always highly recognized and admired and supported the health of family life. Hopefully our public policies do too, with generous policies towards families, uh, ch child allowances, support for child, uh, to fight child poverty, uh, maybe healthcare benefits for all family members, child care subsidies for children especially. The uh, fourth one is the hardest word on the list there. It's the drawbreaker. Doesn't go through spell check, I've discovered. The word subsidiarity, which uh, comes from the Latin word subsidium, means assistance. And all the different levels of society, our popes have taught us for the last hundred years, all the levels of society uh, need to work together to assist each other uh, and to uh, maybe have a division of labor that uh, a local government and a national government need to work hand in glove, divide up the uh, proper duties that uh, can be efficiently executed by each one. And it's not just about government, although that's the rest of the slide there, the proper role of government. It's also about civil society. That includes voluntary associations, organizations that you might join. These are sometimes called the third sector. It's not uh, government and it's not uh, corporations, it's voluntary associations. You might be a member of, I don't know, the Knights of Columbus or the uh, Catholic Charities or uh, so many religious and even non-religious organizations that are charitable, that maybe support the arts or education. Those all contribute in their own way to the 
good social order. So subsidiarity, the proper role of government, and non-governmental agencies, organizations that make our social life so rich. The fifth one on the list, second to last there, or the E level there, is about property ownership. And in our contemporary society, uh, we, I always think of property as being land, and that's the way it was for most of human history. But in the last, I don't know, 200 years since the Industrial Revolution took place, we have begun to have other kinds of property. Maybe it's capital. Maybe it's finance. Maybe it's uh, money in the bank. Uh, ancient people didn't really have much uh, cash. They didn't they use coins, maybe, but there wasn't an emphasis on currency. Back then, it was mostly land. Uh, and then gradually, it became the means of production, factories, capital, investments, bank accounts, stocks and bonds. And in our modern age, property includes intellectual rights. You might have a copyright or a... Um, what do they call those things? A uh, uh, trademark where you actually own something. Or if you're a published author, you might have the copyright on books and that's and you have the right to, to do, use and distribute them and publish them as you wish. If you have a great deal of property, that's great. But you also, you have a right to it, but you also have a responsibility to make sure that your property, whether it's land or capital or uh, uh, factories or, or productive goods, that they all get used to benefit everyone in society and not just concentrated power in the hands of a few. So the Catholic Church has always been in favor of property ownership, but at the same time, it's recognized that property isn't an absolute right. It is checked by the needs of all people. So if anyone's starving and you own a bakery with thousands of loaves of bread, that suggests something about how those goods uh, crucial for people's desperate survival, how those goods should be distributed in a just social order. And then the final one that we did last week is all about work, the dignity of human labor, the rights of workers, and the support for labor unions. Sometimes people are surprised at how strong the church's stance has been to support working people uh, in the workplace, in the notion of having organized labor unions, um, because without that, popes have been saying this for 130 years, without the right to organize, then the workplace can become a place of humiliation. It's a place where all the power is, is hoarded, monopolized by the owners of industry or factory owners or investors or CEOs. And the workers would really have no bargaining power at all. And it would be a great injustice. The, the power would be uh, imbalanced. So support for this. And I think my closing notes last week were, and it, it prompted some of the best questions in the Q&A session, uh, were about the spirituality of labor. And I'm very interested in this topic. It's underdeveloped. The only Pope who ever really talked about this, to my satisfaction, was Pope John Paul II, who in 1981 wrote this uh, uh, encyclical, there's a picture of him, on human labor. The Latin is laborum exercens. And he talked about spirituality of labor, but he didn't develop it past a few paragraphs. So if you have more questions about that, I would be delighted to engage in some dialogue about that. So that's the end of our review, the six foundational themes of last week of Catholic social teaching. And they are foundational. They're like the, the foundation of a building. And then the question is, how do we build on that foundation? What are the enhancements? Given it's like when you're building a uh, an edifice, right? A house or a or, or a business uh, or a uh, I don't know a hotel or a city hall or, or a cathedral. You first lay the foundation. You get the footings there. You excavate. You get solid foundation, uh, and then you start building up from the ground on that good foundation. And those six themes we just reviewed are are the foundation. And how do you get uh, to enhance that and to make a beautiful edifice, a beautiful building? that uh, goes on top of that. So we'll go to the next slide here where we introduce the four additional themes of Catholic social teaching. And I'll spend nearly 10 minutes on each of these, which will bring us close to eight o'clock. And then we'll, in our last 10 minutes, I'll finish at 810, we'll talk a, a little bit more about some uh, additional material, bonus material, I'm not charging you any more for the last 10 minutes. Uh, although it's, hopefully it'll be a nice surprise, the topics that I cover. 
So these four additional themes, I'll just say what they are, and then we'll spend our minutes on each one. The first is colonialism and economic development, so global economy issues. Secondly, the topic, really important topic, of peace and disarmament. Third, we'll look at that fairly recent theme called the option for the poor and vulnerable. And I'll explain how it's really only in the last 50 years or so that we have this phrase, although the, the meaning behind that phrase goes back to certainly the time of Jesus, in fact, to the time of the ancient Israelite prophets in the Old Testament. And our final theme will be care for the natural environment. We'll talk a little bit about ecology and the ways that we need to care for other creatures besides the human race. So we're going to leave that slide up for the next uh, while, um, probably 40 minutes or so. So if you want to adjust your screen or anything, make it bigger or smaller, feel free to do so. And uh, strap yourself in. We're going we're gonna to do colonialism and economic development. So if you just, uh, if you only listened to last week's webinar, you would probably be thinking that Catholic social teaching is only concerned with one country at a time. I mean, didn't really talk of anything about international relations or how the economy is a globalized economy. It simply didn't come up last week. And to tell you the truth, it didn't come up in the first 60 or 70 years of Catholic social teaching. This is a bit surprising. So popes like uh, Leo the 13th, 1891's encyclical, or um, Pope Pius XI, he wrote the encyclical Quattro Dresum Anno in 1931. They were only focused about what they called the social question or the social order dealing with one country at a time. They didn't turn their attention to the question of how nations relate to each other or how corporations, maybe based in one country, can deal in a just way with other countries beyond their sphere. So we call these international corporations or multinational corporations, also banks that often their business crosses borders, commercial banks that lend to different countries. So this, this introduces a great complexity in the message of Catholic social teaching for anybody who's interested in achieving global justice. And of course, we all want to see global justice. We would be pretty narrow if we were only concerned about our country's economy. So the U.S. economy, sure, very important, probably a source of our sustenance, anybody logged on to this webinar. But we're not uh, isolated. Uh, we don't have a, what they call an autarkic economic regime. We are not separate. No man is an island. No country is an island. Our economy depends upon goods that cross borders. We call those imports or exports. Raw materials from one country get used in the productive process in another country. Also, the labor market, so uh, the, the prevailing labor conditions in the United States, the prevailing wages, for example, have a great deal to do with the wages in other countries. And as you know, some jobs get moved offshore. Factories move from sometimes from the first world, the uh, U.S. and North America and Europe, to places like uh, Asia and Africa and Latin America, where there are lower cost um labor, uh, you know, wa wages are much lower. And that is a way that the global economy is interconnected. And of course, we want there to be fair wages for everybody, not just a few. We want goods to be produced in good labor conditions, good environmental conditions. Uh, I'm sure that many of you know about fair trade goods. Uh, we, it, Where I live here, we have fair trade coffee, making sure that the coffee harvested I don't know, in Latin America or anywhere uh, that comes up here is uh, produced under correct circumstances, not oppressing anybody or those uh, uh, clothing that you have, hopefully not produced in sweatshops with substandard labor conditions, health conditions for workers, whether in the United States or other countries as well. So look for those uh, certifications that your coffee, your clothing and other goods, probably your cars, your computers, are produced in conditions where workers are treated well. So these are all issues that we're dealing with today. But anything that happens in the global economy today is very much tied to the legacy, the past. And as we all know, the past, so to, to look back into the past, think of the, reading your high school textbooks. I, I was a history teacher, by the way, in the state of Massachusetts some years ago. 
uh, at a Catholic high school in Fall River, Massachusetts. Every time I opened up the pages of that world history textbook, a lot of uh, chapters on the ancient world, the medieval world, the early modern world, and that age of exploration and colonization. And of course, that's largely the story of the last 500 years. Columbus crossed the ocean, a European discovering so-called, because he, he wasn't the first human here, but for European purposes, he opened up uh, 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 transportation to the New World, North and South America. Some of that story is good and uh, the spread of civilization, good things. Some of it is frankly very uh, horrible, horrific. Uh, violence, the European empires, the Spanish empire, English, uh, Portuguese empire, French, uh, all of these countries uh, uh, crossed uh, oceans and brought domination, brought exploitation, the legacy of uh, the exploitation of raw materials. They were looking for gold, but they settled for uh, uh, precious wood, precious metals, uh, uh, ore mining. And of course, in the agricultural sector, uh, slavery, the horrors of the slave trade from the 1600s right up to um, uh, the 1800s, uh, millions of people enslaved, the legacy we still live with of um, getting rid of racial animus and racial um, uh, prejudice and discrimination, much of it grew out of the colonial practice of slavery and the oppression of the Native Americans, who obviously the millions of them were here in the New World. Their populations went down because many of them were slain by the European colonists. Others died of diseases brought there from uh, uh, Europe and other places. The extractive industries, they were forced to work in mines, etc. So really not a happy story. The countries of the South, Southern Hemisphere, for the most part, so Africa, uh, parts of Asia like India, and certainly most of Latin America, those, we call them the global south, those countries were dependent upon the, the, the mother countries, the colonizers, the empires, like the British and the French and the uh, Portuguese and the Dutch. They were made dependent. Their economies were at a great disadvantage because they depended upon these mother countries, which controlled them politically but also economically. And even when those empires folded, largely after World War II, the British kind of withdrew from India and many other places. The Portuguese turned their colonies, last colonies over in 1975. Spanish too gradually withdrew from Latin America even earlier than that. It set up a global division of labor that is very skewed to this day. And the, so now we're gonna talk, I've been talking about the economy. What's the religious or church aspect of this? Well, as you know, those conquistador ships that were sent from Spain to the Latin American countries or from England to North America and the French to North America, they usually included not just soldiers and captains on those exploratory ships or those settler ships, and also included missionaries, whether Catholic or Protestant missionaries, all coming over, uh, accompanying the armies, uh, and it, I'm sure that it looked to the natives and maybe to the captured African slaves, it looked like the church and those uh, kings and the uh, empires were working hand in hand. Frankly, it did. But let's not forget that the missionaries had their own agenda, not the same as the king of England or the king of Spain, to bring Christianity, to evangelize to new peoples who had never heard the gospel. So there's obviously a mix of good motives for the Christian missionaries of the 1600s, 1700s, and, and to this very day, really continuing, and the colonizing powers that were in it for money and power. So I don't want to whitewash the situation, but those are the two parts of the colonial legacy that we still have to grapple with uh, a great deal. Was the church complicit in domination? Well, of course it was. Uh, were, were there good motives behind much of what the missionaries did in those ages up to ours? Well, of course there were. It wasn't a selfish motivation, although they did get, uh, I would say, complicit in some of the exploitative practices. So uh, all of these issues around colonization and economic injustice, a domination of the economy's dependency, um, 
is raises the issue of what theologians today call structural injustice. Sometimes we call it structural evil. We even call it social sin. So these concepts uh, have been developed really only in the last 50 or 60 years, mostly since the Second Vatican Council. But they, these concepts give us a really good handle on appreciating the fact that sin and evil and injustice have a way of spreading, of kind of uh, like you, you drop a, rip, a, a, a pebble in a pond and the ripples expand to cover the whole pond surface. If one or just a group of people commit a, a sin, for example, sending soldiers to conquer Indian tribes in North America or any part of the world to dominate them, to take their resources, those few people who started that uh, start a whole chain of causality that causes entire structures like slavery, like um, exploitative banking practices, like global debt. Many third world countries, global South countries are in desperate debt. They owe commercial banks billions and billions of dollars. They can never really repay those uh, debts. Those are called heavily indebted poor countries, HIPCs. All of those structures of debt and economic dependency and even slavery and militarism, uh, uh, empires based on power, raw power, those are all structures that, again, they start small, but they spread out and they cause ripple effects that go down from generation to generation. And anybody who's born into a, an unjust system is very likely to cooperate with it, to be complicit. Think of all the I'm sure good-hearted people uh, who lived in, say, the, the southern states, which became the Confederacy, uh, slaveholding states of the United States. There were 11 states of the old Confederacy, from Virginia to Texas. People that were born into slaveholding families, they, they didn't start the slavery system, but they, I guess they inherited it. They benefited from having chattel slavery, field hands and uh, slaves to do their household work. And uh, sometimes in my mind, I say, well, they, they're to be blamed for um, uh, going along with this system. It's a rotten system, uh, and they should have seen through it and rebelled. Well, I actually do believe they should have uh, refused slavery, maybe moved to the north or, or, or given the freedom. We call that manumission, free their slaves. But that so rarely happened there. So we say that people are sometimes born into situations of great injustice. They can use that as an excuse, but hopefully in their conscience, that was another topic we talked about last time, in their conscience, they should be able to sort out what evil systems they have inherited. How can we reject structural evil and not cooperate with social sin? So you can see how complex these issues are. By the 1960s and 70s, popes started producing encyclical letters, social encyclicals, I'll show you one in a second, that questioned these unjust economic um, sit, uh, structures in the world, uh, misdevelopment, uh, a warped development of the global economy with rich uh, nations in the north and poor countries in the south supplying raw materials, getting paid very low wages, their commodity prices for their ore and their wood and their crops were very low, um, artificially so. So I'm holding up my copy of Popolorum Progressio. This was Pope Pope uh, Paul VI, 1968 encyclical, a uh, 67 encyclical, it's called uh, in English, on the development of peoples. So he was the first pope to issue a full-throated treatment, uh, in, again, 1967, of international justice, okay? He emphasized uh, the, the good that church people could do, especially missionaries, uh, uh, think of all of the wonderful church agencies that work internationally like Caritas International, a lot of the missionary groups like Miserior from Europe. And our country has lots of Catholic relief service work around the world. So there are micro development projects, loans, small micro loans to third world countries to get capital, to get uh, uh, public works projects like clean water, uh, 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 drilling for water, making wells, et cetera. So lots of good work has been going on through church agencies, hopefully supported by church teachings, but it's been a, it took a long time before the church started kind of flexing its muscle in favor of the developed world, ending the injustices that came from the colonialism legacy, we call that decolonization, uh, and from 
supporting a more just economic development. Are we all the way there yet? By no means. Even international agencies that are supposed to be geared towards helping uh, uh, the, the development of the of the billions of people in the global south have often betrayed their mission. I think sometimes of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, which for decades practically strangled those indebted third world countries. Uh, they've had a change of heart. The World Bank and the IMF are all part of the Bretton Woods agreements, so uh, affiliated with the UN. Uh, they all um, uh, basically have developed in recent decades to be more fair-minded and more of an advocate for global the, the people who are suffering from global poverty. I really like that bumper sticker, think globally, act locally. So our our sphere should be global. We, nobody should be beyond our sphere of concern. Uh, even as Americans living in the richest society in the history of the world, we must always be looking beyond our borders. There's no room for isolationism in the Catholic Church's social teachings. The world is one. Uh, Pope Francis says this so often. We must not give in to global indifference to the suffering of people in other countries, whether they're refugees, or people suffering from the effects of climate change or, or political oppression of any sort, certainly economic poverty and um, inequality. Our concern must be for all people. And we call this global solidarity and we must uh, uh, be cognizant of it and actually do something about it. So think globally and act locally, do what you can locally. You can't solve all the world's problems. It's kind of overwhelming just to take them on even to think about them, I get a headache but you can do some things that will be of benefit even in the short term, even on a local scale. Give what you can, volunteer when you can, do a year of service to the Peace Corps or uh, any of those groups, VISTA, et cetera, the Jesuit Volunteer Corps, it, it's wonderful opportunities. Okay, well, we've covered a lot of ground and um, I think that we're ready to go on to the second theme. So the first theme got us thinking about the global reality colonialism, global economic development. And now it's time to consider for about 10 minutes, peace and disarmament. So last week, I hardly mentioned anything about international relations. So we didn't have much of a chance to talk about peace and the importance of, um, of uh, uh, international cooperation and the church's role in this. Just to start at the beginning, we Catholics have inherited a wonderful tradition from the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, where in the, the mindset of ancient Israel, the greatest goal and the greatest gift of God was the Hebrew word shalom. And it comes in Arabic and salam and many languages that have cognates like shalom. It's not just peace in the narrow sense of no one's hitting you or no bullets are being exchanged. So it's not just the absence of war. True peace is a social order where harmony prevails, where people get along, where people uh, understand each other, where they reconcile any conflicts. If there are grievances from the past, they're willing to look past them in a, in a process of reconciliation, burying the hatchet, we might say sometimes. Those are the qualities of all human relations local, maybe in your family, burying grudges, right? Or in your neighborhood, getting along with your neighbor uh, uh, in your street, talking to people across the backyard fence, um, lo localities, going to town meeting. I know that's a big Massachusetts, New England uh, institution. That's a great gift to our country, town meetings, agreeing with uh, people as much as possible. But that piece extends not just to national politics. Don't you wish we had less polarization uh, in our nation's capital, Congress, but also internationally. Global peace has long been a concern of the Catholic Church and of our popes. You go back to the Middle Ages, when popes were often the um, bargainers, they were arbitrators between warring kingdoms. In fact, I'm very proud that my own Jesuit order had a special ministry in the 1600s, especially of um, bringing peace between uh, 
uh, you know, like warring parties in many parts of Europe. If you've known about the uh, Hatfields and the McCoys, I think that's a West Virginia clans that were fighting. But go back to the time of Shakespeare in around the year 1600. The Capulets and the Montagues, that's uh, Romeo and Juliet's families, they were at each other's throats. Those kinds of situations where a, 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 a city state was divided into factions. Jesuits were often sent in and did their best in parish settings to reconcile warring parties. And that was on a small scale, but then, of course, on an international scale as well. And it goes right up to our time. Uh, at the beginning of World War I, Pope Benedict XV tried to negotiate between the Axis powers and the uh, Allies. Uh, it didn't work. He was he died of a broken heart shortly after World War I ended. It was just so traumatic for that pope. And every pope since then who's had to be on the throne of Peter in Rome while a war was was raging around them. Think of Pius XI and Pius XII during the rise of Hitler, the German Reich, and then, of course, the horrors of World War II with tens of millions killed, the Holocaust. Those popes suffered a great deal. They wanted to bring about peace. They were largely powerless. And John the Twenty Third, back in the early 1960s, uh, hated to see the flare-ups of violence. He, they, uh, he hated to see the Cuban Missile Crisis. In fact, he wrote Pacha Menteras, his 1963 encyclical, uh, Peace on Earth, that's the translation, to alleviate the tensions uh, that led to that Berlin Missile Crisis that could have led to the extinction of humanity, that certainly continued for another 30 years in the form of the horrible Cold War, the Berlin Wall, which eventually fell in 1989. And again, a pope was instrumental there, John Paul II. So popes have been, and the Catholic Church in general, including Jesuits, I'm proud of that, have been in the middle of advocating for peace, trying to bring about international peace. Now, of course, it's an idealistic thing to say that we can bring about peace and just kind of wave our hands and make the whole world sing in harmony, sing kumbaya on a mountaintop. That doesn't happen. We know that. We also know that there are different traditions, even within Christianity, much less other religions, of how to address conflict when it does happen. So just to say the obvious, the two main lines of Christian reflection on peace are pacifism and the just war theory. Pacifism is taking the literally the words of Jesus, do not strike anyone in anger. If someone strikes you, turn the other cheek. If someone forces you to, to go one mile carrying their bags, Roman soldiers did that in his time, uh, go a second mile. So show no resistance to evil. So that was the way of Jesus. Uh, even when he was arrested, he could have called down the angels to strike down his attackers, to punch his pilot's men, but he did not. In fact, when Peter drew his sword, Jesus said, put your sword back in its sheath there in the Garden of Gethsemane. So we have the literal words of Jesus. We have early centuries of Christianity, took them very literally, took those words literally. Christians did not serve in the Roman army for the first 300 years of Christian history. And then after Emperor Constantine, the Christian in 312 and following, Christians did serve in the army. And uh, we began to develop, especially with the influence of of um, St. Augustine of Hippo, who standardized the categories of just war theory in the early fifth century, we had the development of the just war theory. So no longer pacifism, the mainstream of thought of Christian um, uh, theory of war, of war and peace is that some violence is justified under certain conditions. It has to be a defensive war. You can't start the war, you can only respond to aggression an unjust aggressor who threatens innocent people, especially civilians, unarmed people, must be stopped. You have an obligation. We call that responsibility to protect. So these are the main lines of the just war theory. It has to be a last resort after you've exhausted all possible diplomacy. It has to be properly constituted under a just authority. You've got to have a reasonable chance of success. Otherwise, it's futile and you're just causing more death at the hands of, um, of aggressors, et cetera. So the just war theory, very complicated, um, uh, a kind of a, a product of human reason. Uh, that's not in the Bible at all, by the way, but uh, over the centuries, theologians like Augustine and Aquinas and, and uh, 
even some early Jesuits who worked on this, Cardinal Bellarmine worked on this, and uh, Suar Francisco Suarez, Spanish Jesuit in the 17th century, they worked on the, the uh, criteria of the just war theory. And remember, it's not to bless war, it's not to justify war when it shouldn't be justified, it's criteria to limit war, both jus uh, ad vellum, which means justice in the approach of war or as war is a possibility on entering a war, when's, when is it just to enter a war? That's jus ad bellum. And then the, there's also other criteria called jus in bello. Once a war has started, what are the just conditions, um, uh, kind of standard operating procedures under which you can conduct a war? And th these conditions include never harming civilians, uh, proportionality, don't don't um, uh, escalate war. If, it, if someone attacks you with a stick or uh, maybe a, a bow and arrow, don't pull out a, a machine gun, much less a, a bomb or a nuclear weapon to uh, overkill, to, to uh, wipe them out. So those are some of the basics of our tradition of peace and uh, just war. Very complicated. I'm teaching a course right now to undergraduate students at Fordham University on the just war theory and pacifism, and they appreciate the two strands of Christian thought on this. And by the way, if you're interested in these topics, one of the best things, one of the best documents the church has ever produced regarding war and peace is this, do I'll hold up my copy here, this document called The Challenge of Peace, God's Promise and Our Response. It was written by the Conference of United States Catholic Bishops in the year 1983. It gives you every, it's, it's available free on the website of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, usccb.org, just called Challenge of Peace. Plug it in there, it'll come up and it walks you through everything that I tried to cover in five minutes there uh, in much greater detail. Obviously on our minds today when we talk about war is the war in Ukraine. Just hours ago, that very brave um, president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, uh, he gave back-to-back -back speeches in the United Nations after President Biden. Uh, obviously, his country was overrun by Putin's Russia. This horrible attack in February of last year has been going on for over 18 months now. Um, uh, thousands, tens of thousands killed, soldiers on both sides, hundreds of thousands of those, but even tens of thousands of defenseless, innocent Ukrainian citizens, men, women, and children. And it's just the most horrible thing. And uh, Pope Francis has gotten in the middle of it. He would love to mediate a settlement, to negotiate, help both sides. He, uh, at the beginning, he tried to keep an even keel. He got criticized for being too nice to the Russians. He, he gave a talk to some Russian pilgrims in Rome recently, and he praised the history of, of, of Russian uh, uh, arts and culture. He was criticized for that. It's very hard to be a mediator, to try to uh, be between the two sides without alienating them so that mediation can occur. So it's been very complex. And every time there's a war or a military action, you'll find uh, Catholic reflection, sometimes in the form of popes or bishops, talking about the um, conditions for peace, how to make those conditions more likely, how to, uh, not just peacekeeping, but peace building, creating the conditions, building the conditions of trust, international uh, uh, reconciliation that will lead to people disarming, and the word disarmament is there for a good reason. It's really important to stop the global arms trade. Pope Francis uh, spoke a great deal about this when he came to the United Nations and to the U.S. Congress in September of 2015. Disarm, ending the global arms bazaar, he calls it, that leaves blood on the hands of anyone who manufactures, sells, exports weapons. And of course, our government, tens of billions of dollars a year of arms exports, some gifts to countries like Israel and now Ukraine, some of them sales to countries like Saudi Arabia and uh, Egypt, et cetera. So complex issue. We're never really going to figure out exactly what the right formula is for when uh, 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 some force is justified. Who's who's a, how is it appropriate? Uh, my uh, frank opinion is that the just war theory is often misused uh, to just kind of put a fig leaf over, justify any old war that you want. And a lot of Catholics argue that in 2003, when the United States invaded Iraq, which had not harmed us really, 
It was Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda. That's not the same as Iraq. We chose a surrogate enemy and rushed into war. John Paul II urged uh, uh, the United States not to start that war. And of course, we did with that shock and awe campaign in March of 2003. And many, many people died, mostly Iraqis, many of them civilians. So a constant witness to peace, a constant appeal for disarmament, but also the complexity to recognize that the Catholic Church also has uh, a just war theory. There are times to justify war and a great tradition of uh, pacifism as well. All right. So we are now up to our fourth theme. Good. We're right on time. Option for the poor and the vulnerable. So first thing to say is we didn't really have this phrase that's usually extended as the preferential option for the poor, the marginalized, and the vulnerable. That phrase first appeared really in any church document, really only in 1979. That was the year when the bishops of Latin America, the Consejo Episcopal of Latin, Latin Latino Americana, um, the bishops got together in Puebla, Mexico, wrote wonderful documents, and they were drawing from this work. So uh, Gustavo Gutierrez is often called the father of liberation theology here. I think you can see it now, right? And he wrote this book. Uh, it was translated into English only in 1973. It had been out a few years in Spanish called A Theology of Liberation. Uh, and let's say 1973 to 2023. Ooh, it's the 50th anniversary of this book coming up uh, this fall. So if you ever have seen a copy, here's the copy that I have, it's an original edition for 1973, Orbis Books has this picture. I think it's from a uh, Peruvian, uh, Gustavo Gutierrez was Peruvian who wrote this book uh, of Christ on the cross. It's very uh, vivid and graphic. So liberation theology influenced Catholic theology. I call this kind of a trickle up effect. The liberation theologians in places like Peru and El Salvador, some Jesuits there like John Sabrino and uh, Ignacio A. O. Correa, one of the Jesuit martyrs of, of El Salvador who was killed by government forces in 1989. These were uh, people who thought through the theme of the Bible that has to do with liberation. The gospel, the good news is a news that liberates us. And of course, that's not just spiritual liberation. It is also economic liberation, political liberation. If anybody or any system is dominating us, not allowing us to have democratic participation, not allowing us to vote, or economically, not allowing us to have a decent living, a, a living wage, or uh, seizing our land or preventing us from getting the means to a good living subsistence, then those um, oppressive conditions need to be overthrown. Now, that sounds a little bit you know, Marxist or radical or socialist. Liberation theologians are often accused of that. In its purest form, the form that I, I would commend to you, liberation theology is part of the church's theological heritage, a very valuable one, a fairly recent one, but it's one that brings out the message of liberation that Jesus preached. Remember, he said in Luke chapter four, the beginning of his public ministry, I have come to call the poor to good news, to bring good news to the poor, liberation to those who are enslaved and suffering in any way. That's a constant part of our church message, and it has a, a rightful place in our heritage of theology, and now it's worked its way into many papal encyclicals. Even John Paul II, who was a little suspicious of liberation theology in Latin America, uh, used that phrase many times in his, uh, his uh, encyclicals from the 80s and the 90s. John Paul II, uh, of Pope Francis picks up the message by using very frequently a phrase that John the 23rd used when he called Vatican II in 1962 uh, or so. He says, how I wish for a church of the poor, a church of the poor that sides with the poor, that favors the poor, and is a poor church, not beholden to uh, the affluent, not just kind of being the chaplains of the rich sectors of society. It's more of an issue in Latin America where the concentration of wealth in just a few families in many countries is very strong. But even in our middle-class American society, there's a place for this message to stand up for the poor. I'll show one more document here. The US bishops in 1986 
had this great document called Economic Justice for All, a pastoral letter on uh, Catholic social teaching and the United States economy. Again, you can get this free online at the bishop's um, uh, at the bishop's website, usccb.org. Just look for Economic Justice for All. And they too talk about the ways that we measure our economy. And it is measured by how our economy treats the poor. Does it invite uh, the poor, under-resourced people, people of modest means to participate in the economy, inviting them to join labor unions and to have a say in the workplace? Those are important questions so that we share power and that we don't concentrate power with the great uh, wealth inequality that we have today. Okay, well, I've covered just about everything there. Just a couple of closing notes on this. Uh, you see the word preferential option for the poor, but remember, it's not an exclusive option for the poor. It's preferential, but not exclusive. The church always cares for all people. The mission to salvation, to, to uh, consolation of all people, doesn't exclude anybody, not the rich, not the powerful. Their souls are worthy of pastoral care too. However, in history, by and large, it is the poor, the vulnerable, the under-resourced who need special protection. I've often heard people say this, if you had four children and one of them needed special medical treatments, maybe a, a developmentally disabled child, a child in need of special uh, needs, you would spend the extra resources for that child. Similarly here, the church has special care and concern as God does, as Jesus did, for those who are poor and vulnerable. Okay, well, I think we've done well with that theme, and we're up to our final theme for this part, the four additional themes. The last one there is care for the natural environment. And by the way, I'm going to treat this briefest of all, not just because I'm close to my, uh, my time on this unit, but because next time, when we do six themes associated with Pope Francis, I call this the renewal of Catholic social teaching under Pope Francis, I will spend ample time on his Laudato Si, his great encyclical on the environment from 2015. He's about to um, update that. He promised us a follow-up document this October. So get ready for that the first week of October. It's too bad that our, our last session is in September. I'd come back and uh, talk about whatever that new document is. I would speed read it if necessary. Uh, but anyway, care for our natural environment has really only been expressed very well and very clearly in church documents in the last 30 or 40 years. Starting in 1990, uh, John Paul II, and then the U.S. bishops the following year, 1991, and then later other popes, Benedict XVI had an excellent treatment of the environment in his letter Caritas and Veritate, and um, uh, Pope Francis with uh, Laudato Si, uh, Benedict was called the Green Pope, and I don't know, what do we call Francis? The Greener Pope, I don't know, something like that. These two, last two popes, but also John Paul II, the last three popes, have been very strong on our obligation to care for the environment, not to uh, kind of you know rape, pillage, and plunder the earth, sack it for its resources, extractive industries like ores and mining, but to have real sense of stewardship, of caring for the earth, like a steward cares for a household, or like a gardener. If you have a garden, I'm sure you lavish lots of care, lots of effort on your garden. We've actually had to make up since 1990, I would say, we've had to make up for nearly 2,000 years of kind of neglecting this aspect of God's gift to us. We've had lots of teachings about economic issues, but far too few have recognized far too much of papal energy or theologians energy um, has been expended reflecting on how we can be a good species. Oh, God gave us, uh, you know, we're at the top of the pyramid. Uh, God created us in God's image and likeness. But caring for the natural environment has been only an afterthought. Mostly it's been about exploiting the natural environment uh, kind of enslaving it, making it work for our good. And think of how short-sighted that is. If we pollute the earth, we despoil the air and the water, we wipe out species, uh, endangered species, uh, endangering biodiversity, ruining habitats, we're, it's only like a boomerang effect. We're hurting ourselves. We're creating a world that's less hospitable, 
less beautiful, less uh, able to care for our needs, and we won't have the ability to hand off to next generations, future generations, the good things that we've had. Uh, so we'll, next time we'll talk about intergenerational solidarity. It's a concept that Pope Francis really kind of coined uh, just uh, eight years ago in Laudato Si. Plenty of time to talk about that. What I just want to say here is how important it is to maintain a sense of urgency, to maintain a sense of the common good. Here, we're linking this to an earlier theme, the common good that is global and includes all species, plants and animals, uh, terrestrial and aquatic, and the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, all of them have a special place in God's eye. God created each one specially. Each one, to, I'm going to paraphrase St. Francis of Assisi now, gives glory to God in its own way. Remember how he talked about other species as brother moon, sister, uh, sister moon, brother sun, etc. He, he went through the whole litany of all the creatures that are like kin to us, not to be exploited, but to be appreciated, cared for, and nurtured as best we can. Okay, and I just want to say a, a few final words on the environment here, just to uh, give a, a shout out to the many great uh, church-based nonprofit organizations that have been working to uh, enhance our environmental concern. My favorite one is the CCC, the Catholic Climate Covenant. I know some of the founders, Dan Misla, one of my former students, uh, Dan DeLeo, and they have new leadership now centered in Washington, D.C. I've done some speaking programs for them. Uh, try, they've been trying to get uh, priests and deacons to preach about the environment more often in their sermons. If you haven't never heard a uh, good homily about the environment, then we have more work to do, don't we? It's a really important part of our church's social teaching and of really part of our um our vocation as people to care for the earth, not just humans, but all creatures, uh, animals, plants as well. All right, so I think we're at the end of our list of four additional themes of Catholic social teaching. And by the way, when we do Pope Francis's renewal of Catholic social teaching that week, next week, each of the four you see on your screen right now will come back in its own way. I call this with the Francis difference or the a special spin that Pope Francis places on economic justice, that's the first one, on peacemaking. He has a, a lot of things about negotiating peace and being uh, agents of peace building, about economic inequality, that's the third one on your screen right now, the poor and the vulnerable. And of course, one of the six themes we'll treat next week uh, is his care for ecology and the natural environment, what he calls our common home, the earth that we have to share. Okay, so I guess we're ready for the next slide if uh, we'll advance that one. Here is some bonus material. It will take me less than 10 minutes, so roughly two minutes each on each of these five themes that you see in front of you. I didn't advertise this in advance, but I consider these five themes, I, I call them a user's guide to Catholic social teaching. If you can appreciate, appropriate, understand each of these five themes, you will have a huge head start in applying the principles that, again, popes and bishops and documents have given us, even if you don't never get around to reading all those documents. If you understand these five pointers, they're kind of like caveats or uh, warnings, a user's guide, like you would get with a, uh, if you bought an appliance, you would get a user's guide to your refrigerator or your uh, uh, smart TV or something. So this is my little take on what um, themes to keep in mind as we uh, apply Catholic social teaching? How do we implement all of these encyclicals? How do we apply them in the real world? So you see the first one there. In our United States, in this country, we have from the beginning of our Republic, the Bill of Rights has the First Amendment, which includes the right to freedom of speech, and freedom of religion. In fact, there's two clauses there, the religion clauses of the First Amendment. Uh, Congress shall make no law regarding an establishment of religion, so that's the no establishment clause, nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. No one can prohibit the free exercise 
of your religion. So that's religious freedom. So you exercise your, your religion without any interference of the government at the state level and the federal level. And you don't insist that yours or any other religion is established, that it receives benefits, exclusive benefits from the government. That is our constitutional, um, uh, we call it separation of church and state, right? We're used to that, we're comfortable with that. No group should be privileged. Everyone should have the freedom uh, without restriction uh, to practice their religion. Even if it seems, you know, like you don't like someone else's religion, that doesn't mean you should put it, use the government as a, as a sword uh, against them. And of course, you should have a shield. That's, that's called the sword and the shield approach. You should have, you be shielded from any interference with your religion. So respect the proper roles of church and state. It's a division of labor. And implicit in this is the simple reality that we live in a pluralistic society. No one group has ever monopolized our country. No religious group or ethnic group. We are a melting pot. We're a mix. And it's wonderful uh, to have the, the variety of uh, people. So we have an institutional separation of church and state. We follow the Constitution. We accommodate all religions without um, a favor or uh, uh, or favoritism. Um, so uh, what does this mean for Catholic social teaching? Well, it doesn't mean that we should be quieted, that we should, our mouths should be covered, uh, you know, uh, duct tapes over the mouth. Uh, you, you might think, oh, you know, it's impolite to talk in public in our pluralistic society with the First Amendment rights of people of other religions besides the Roman Catholic religion. Uh, if we speak up. No, that's not the sense at all. In fact, John Paul II had a wonderful phrase I quoted all the time. He used it in the 1990s in a series of talks he gave. The church does not seek to impose its ideas or its will. The church seeks to propose good ideas, good candidates for public policies. So you got that wording? Not to impose forcibly, but to propose with civility, with a sense of modesty and to share our wonders of Catholic social teaching. In fact, in recent popes ever since the 1960s, when they write an encyclical letter, they put in the opening line, this is addressed to all, and they go through a list of people, to all bishops, to the Catholic laity, and to all people of goodwill, whether you're Catholic or not, Christian or not, no matter what your religion is or no religion at all, anybody, can read the words of Catholic social teaching. Uh, I often think of this as uh, someone of another faith, kind of, here, I got my encyclicals here. Someone from another faith um, looking over our shoulder as we read. This is my copy of Laudato Si. If I'm reading my copy here, somebody who might be Jewish or Hindu or Muslim, kind of looking over my shoulder saying, yeah, there's some good, I don't know much about your Pope, but he seems like he's on the right track there. That's my model of a wonderful sharing of Catholic social teaching without imposing it. Can we appeal? Can we offer up good ideas that anybody can use uh, to their benefit, addressed to all people of goodwill? My second part of the user's guide, you can see there on, on your screen, number two, to acknowledge the tensions between private and public, between the private dimensions of faith and the idea that ours is a public church as it functions in the wider society. So I could say a lot about this, but uh, faith should never be exclusively a private thing. Now, faith, of course, has private dimensions. I don't often talk about my private prayer life to other people, my spiritual director, I suppose. Uh, you might have a spiritual director at Glastonbury Abbey, I hope you do, uh, or a Jesuit spiritual director with our Ignatian spirituality of the spiritual exercises. That's great. But you probably don't want to, if, if you're elected to Congress or the Senate, you probably don't want to stand up in the well of the Senate and talk about your private religious experiences, your visions, your Marian piety. These are all good things, but they have their time and their place. So keep that private dimension of faith alive, appropriate, uh, share things in appropriate ways. But remember, our faith is has to be in some ways public. That's that phrase, public church or public theology, uh, it means that when we see injustices in our country, in our state, in our municipality, our city, um, 
that we should address those. Again, we shouldn't be afraid to use some faith language. It probably isn't the first language you should reach for in a political uh, setting like a Congress, but we should uh, use all of our faith language in an appropriate way. A friend of mine was Father Ken Himes, a Franciscan, recently retired from Boston College. He wrote a book called The Fullness of Faith, and it's about the public dimensions of, of, of our faith, and he uses the phrase public church in the subtitle of that, of that book, Public Theology. So doing theology in public, not being afraid to bring out of our tradition messages about social justice, about peace, and about, uh, for example, ecology as well. Okay, so that is the second one. I think we covered it pretty well. The third one is another one that's about balancing two things. So we want to avoid two extreme interpretations of Catholic social teaching. This is akin to what I said at the beginning, what it is and what it can't be. It can't be uh, answered an answer guide to everybody's answer to everything. It cannot be, as I typed up in that slide there, a blueprint of technical solutions. Bishops, for example, when they write letters or pastoral letters on the economy or on peace, or when a pope talks about either one, these are churchmen. They're, they're, they're uh, aided by theologians, only occasionally by economists or, I don't know, foreign foreign relations experts or military experts. They do have a certain amount of expertise, but not the full technical expertise. So don't expect the documents of Catholic social teaching to be a blueprint of technical solutions. Don't expect Catholic social teaching to exhibit technical expertise in complex questions like the economy, what, you know, what's the tax rate? What's the proper budget for the U.S.? I hope we get a budget by the end of uh, September or else we'll be in a government shutdown. Those are questions reserved for the public sphere, for politicians who know more, and economists who know more about these things. But on the other hand, Catholic social teaching shouldn't be overly modest and just kind of throw up the, their hands and say, oh, well, anything goes. Don't be easily malleable. There are firm principles that we must stand up for, protecting the poor, protecting peace, being good stewards of creation, and all the other 10 items on our list, standing up for the common good, protecting labor, all of those are really important values. Let's not be mealy-mouthed about this. I often quote the late, great, he's been dead 20 years now, Monsignor George Higgins, one of the first great labor priests. He uh, helped uh, uh, the labor issue, he helped all the bishops, the bishops' conference on labor issues. And if you're old enough, you may remember for 40 years, he wrote a column that appeared in almost every diocesan newspaper. And that would include the Boston Pilot, by the way. Uh, and his weekly column was called The Yardstick. Anybody remember Monsignor George Higgins, labor priest, The Yardstick column? Well, I think of Catholic social teaching as a yardstick. It helps us measure how well our economy is going, how it treats workers, for example, how our foreign policy is going. Is it leading towards peace or is it perpetuating militarism, et cetera? Those are the kinds of, that's an analogy I really like. A, 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 not a blueprint, but a yardstick for measuring things. Okay, I could do the last two really quickly. Uh, and by the way, all of these are about balancing. The fourth one is to balance these two values, respect for the individual and, on the one hand, and on the other hand, a high regard for the common good of the entire community. Going back to my opening themes from last week, the first one was human dignity, so that's about individuals and their rights. The second one was about solidarity, the common good, participation. There's always going to be a balance in Catholic social teaching between the individual and the social. One person, the larger community. If we get that balance right, then we're doing something right. And I often say this, there, there are plenty of individualists in US society. In fact, really individualism is the first language that we probably get. It's me, it's my, it's the me generation. It's the, I, it's the uh, me first decade, right? But we need that second language of the common good of concern for others. We call this communitarianism, care for the community, the common good. And sadly, there are hardly any voices of communitarianism in our society. I can't think of any voice stronger than the Catholic 
church and its leaders and its uh, great traditions, its the theologian, lay people, rank and file, people in the pews who get together every Sunday and worship communally, community, communal prayer, community worship, being in a parish community. It means so much. I wish other groups besides, besides Catholics and their institutional church would reflect such a high regard for the common good. We are the voice, the carrier, I say, the vehicle of communitarianism in our American society, which is all too often individualistic, too self-centered for my tastes. Finally, at the bottom of that list there is simply, it's something about the future, actually, the past and the future. With Catholic social teaching, knowing the themes as you now know them, if you've been attentive the last two webinars, we recognize the status of Catholic social teaching as a great inheritance. It's a wonderful tradition building upon itself, pope to pope, document to document, world crisis to world crisis, uh, from like uh, the uh, crisis of industrialization to the Cuban Missile Crisis to the environmental crisis and the global refugee crisis. We move through history, always being challenged by new things. But at the same time, we get what I call the growing edge there, the last line. We have a growing edge of new themes, addressing new challenges in ways that can be creative. Sure, sure still true to our tradition, but having a growing end, it's almost like a vine. Uh, some vines, like uh, grapevines, grow so fast, you can almost see them growing at the end, right? Day to day, week by week, uh, an ivy vine that might be crawling up your brick wall or something. That I, That's a very beautiful image to me, and it's a fitting and encouraging image for Catholic social teaching. Our doctrine is able to develop. develop. Sure, there's a core of non-negotiable, the unalterable words of the gospel, but we're also able, again, to use our reason, use our uh, uh, tradition and our new experiences to update the message, to make it adequate for today, and to unpack the doctrines of our faith. All right, so I'm exhausted, oh, but I still have to take your questions. So we are at the end of my lecture. Can we go to the... Uh, to the next slide. So that was bonus material. Uh, nobody uh, was uh, bargaining for the user's guide to Catholic social teaching. Oh, and just to say, next week we'll return, same time, same link, I believe, right? The same Zoom link you've been using. And the main topic next week will be these six themes, the renewal of Catholic social teaching in the 10 years, the decade of Pope Francis, who has renewed us on, I'll just say the list here, treating economic inequality, treating worker justice, treating the environment, teachings on family life, concern for refugees, and peacemaking, right? Those are the six, I actually previewed most of those six already, that you will uh, come to even greater appreciation of how Pope Francis has contributed to what I just said, the growing end of our wonderful tradition. It's a great tradition, but it's never, if it's it's not static, it's dynamic, it's still growing. We haven't reached the end of all the wonders and riches of Catholic social teaching. So here's where I plug my own books. This is shameless. Mercy, so Mercy in Action is a book that I wrote about the social teachings of Pope Francis. It's on your screen there. I'm holding up one of my many copies here. Uh, and it came out in the year 2018, at which time Pope Francis had been Pope for five years, right? So that book draws from uh, five years of Pope Francis's social teachings. Uh, so you could buy that. It's on Roman and Littlefield. That's a great publisher. I published many books with them. And it's on uh, Amazon.com. The, the two other books there, Living Justice, it's been out for a long time, but the fourth classroom edition is coming out, I think it's October 3rd or so. So first week of October, it's already listed on the publisher's website, and they're going to give you the uh, URL link there. Uh, and it's already on amazon.com. You can pre-order it, and you'll get it shipped in by October 10th or so. And the third book there is Pope Francis as Moral Leader, a book that I wrote, uh, again, with 10 years of Pope Francis material under our belts, We've seen him be a moral leader. Uh, I'll tell you the chapters there. It's Pope Francis as ethicist, Pope Francis as, um, what is it called? Uh, uh, discerner, Pope Francis as communicator, 
And the fourth and final chapter is Pope Francis as Advocate for Social Justice. So uh, uh, if you read all three of those books, I'll, I'll, you'll pass my quiz next week. <laughs> okay. So a uh, uh, shameless plug for my books. They're both on, um, they're both on uh, uh, Amazon as well as the publisher. Paulus Press has published, uh, uh, is publishing Pope Francis as Moral Leader. Okay. Enough for shameless plugs. We are now up to questions. And I know that um, the questions have been gathered gradually. People put them into the uh, Q&A box, which I don't have access to, but uh, who uh, is ready to uh, prompt me with the first question? Well, thank you again, um, Father Massaro. Again, a wonderful um, evening and a lot to think about. Um, we have 10 questions. We have two in-house questions and um, there are um, eight from the audience. Um, One minute per question. We go to 8.30. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll do the in-house uh, first so I can get rid of this the screen. Um, in spite of Pope Francis's advocacy for moral leadership, he has received a lot of criticism from many lay Catholics and clergy. Can you speak to what the source, scripture, tradition, or reason of that criticism might be? Good. Yeah, um, I, I'm actually very uh, distressed. <laughs> uh, as you could tell, I, I've given an appreciative reading of Pope Francis, and there's more to come next week, and I've written a lot. So uh, I, I know he's not a perfect uh, person or a perfect leader. By the way, he admits that openly. He's made mistakes. He made mistakes when he dealt with the Chilean bishops, sex abuse crisis. He got bad information. He's made some mistakes and maybe some appointments. So Obviously, he's not perfect. And his first interview with Father Antonio Spadaro, uh, it was published in America Magazine in September of 2013. Um, it's called A Big Hope Heart Open to God. In that, the first sentence, uh, the first question to him was, who are you? Who is the, who is Mario, Jorge, Jorge Mario Bergoglio? His first sentence was a, a very Ignatian answer, very Jesuit answer. I am a sinner. I know I am a sinner, but one loved by God. So, we need to forgive people their sins, their mistakes. The the um, the, the gist of the criticisms of Pope Francis are usually, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, people have different opinions. It usually comes down to people who are worried that he's introducing too many changes um, which could cause confusion, that he's not upholding uh, what's good in the tradition, the received tradition, and that somehow he's changing focus too fast for some people's taste. It's a matter of taste. Well, again, I, I would defend him on this. I don't think, frankly, he hasn't really changed any actual doctrines. Uh, the code of canon law was really only uh, altered to make um, a clearer penalties for priest abusers, better processes for uh, uh, what's the word, a addressing uh, Vatican court cases when abuse issues come up. Uh, that was a uh, I think it's book six of the Code of Canon Law that was recently amended. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, the only change he really made was uh, regarding um, uh, capital punishment. He inserted the word, uh, the death penalty seems now to be inadmissible. That's a one level further deeper than the prohibition that John Paul II put back in the 1990s. So again, on paper, I don't think he's introduced changes. I agree that his style... I, I call it refreshing, but some people might think that it's not as um, somehow regal or um, what's the word I'm looking for, dignified as previous popes. He doesn't like to wear the fancier papal garments. That's a small thing. He rides around in a Ford Focus or a Fiat instead of a I don't know, limousine or something. Some people want their popes to be dressed up and drive around more fancily. The substance of what he has done is not on the level of church laws or church doctrines, minor changes there. The style, yes. But I think the concern is that his overall style, less formal, more open to the voice of the poor, those seem to be the things that just some people are just allergic to. So again, I'm, as a Jesuit, I'm probably going to defend Pope Francis 95% of the time. I, when I hear criticisms, I try to give it the plus sign, put a most positive interpretation on it. Um, which is uh, people are searching for certainty in an uncertain age, and maybe they just see the the kind of changes of style in Pope Francis a little bit too rapid for their taste. So there's some ideological things there too about traditionalism and liturgy. I'm no expert in, in those things, but 
I'm going to back Pope Francis and try to build bridges to those who don't agree with him. For example, when he reaches out to the LGBTQ community, that ruffles the feathers of a lot of people as well. So I'll try to be understanding about that. And Pope Francis says, go ahead, criticize me. It, it, it rolls off me like water off the back of a duck. He, he, he's confident enough to take some criticism very well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one more in-house uh, question. Um, I read today in America Media that Pope Pius XII may have known the extent of the extermination of Jews in Poland during World War II but was afraid to speak out for fear of losing the intelligence, feeding him the information. Can you speak to that? Uh, yes, I read that news article both on America. It was also in the New York Times. Um, I have friends who work in this area, Jesuits who are church historians, and uh, realized that the Vatican archives uh, were opened just about the time that the pandemic started fr from this era, the Pope Pius the 11th and 12th era. Pope Francis likes uh, transparency. So he ordered the Vatican archives in that era to be opened. And of course, then the pandemic struck and they could only be open in very limited. Uh, uh, the scholars have to actually sit there with a pencil and they can't use Xerox machines or anything. So it's been very slow, but you're absolutely correct. These latest news reports, they, un they dug up a, a letter from a German Jesuit in the early 40s. So yes, uh, Pius XII had a certain, it's, it's becoming increasingly clear, had a certain amount of knowledge about how horrible uh, Hitler was treating the Jews and killing them, not just, you know, Kristallnacht was in 1938, not just breaking their glass windows and sending them away to concentration camps, but gassing them in places like Auschwitz and Dachau and Belsen. So yes, it's clear. Po uh, Pope Pius XII has a lot of explaining to do now. He's not around anymore. Obviously, we can put ourselves in the mindset of a pope who's very defensive, surrounded by Mussolini's Italy and alliance with uh, Hitler's Germany. And then, of course, the German troops were on the Italian peninsula. He was probably trying not to offend Hitler or Mussolini, despite what he knew. He was trying, perhaps, to uh, assist the uh, religious orders, Jesuits, but mo actually more often monks and religious sisters who hid away thousands of Jews in Rome and other places uh, to safeguard them. And he didn't want to, uh, Pius XII didn't want to provoke the attack. So I'm not making excuses for Pius XII. I'm trying to get into his mindset. Remember that line from uh, Shakespeare, heavy is the head that wears the crown. That must have been the hardest job that anybody ever had, being a pope during wartime when you were surrounded by the fascist regimes of Mussolini and uh, Hitler. So I'd like to know more. I think the historians are still getting us those details. Again, no excuse for uh, being a collaborator with the Hitlers of this world if he if he did, in fact, turn a blind eye to the genocide. But of course, we, we have to get into his head and see what were the many factors uh, in his defensive approach at that time. So I, if I were Pope, I would have done more. But again, I would have been more uh, also uh, what's the word, subjecting the church to vulnerable, uh, so making it susceptible to being attacked by Mussolini and Hitler. So it was a no-win situation. Uh, uh, let's keep reading those books as the, as information from those archives comes out. Thank you. Um, an anonymous attendee as, asks, how does freedom of religion intersect with human rights? For example, forcing our stance on abortion on those who believe otherwise. Yes. Uh, so the hardest questions of all, and it's a very good question, the hardest questions of all are about standing up for values that we as, as Catholics, um, about the sanctity of life and the dignity and the prohibition on abortion, uh, God's uh, the dignity of each person has from the moment of conception to the moment of natural birth, standing up for those bedrock principles in a country that most of the people, most of the time, uh, make excuses or, or exceptions uh, and will support uh, abortion rights or don't respect, don't stand with the unborn the way we do. Uh, obviously, one thing we can do is to make our voices heard, to make the most um, uh, persuasive case we can, the most attractive case we can about preserving unborn life. Um, and hope that it persuades people. I'm a, I'm a big fan of what I call the cultural strategy to stop abortion, to limit abortion, to end abortion, ideally. That's the cultural strategy by way of persuasion, which is a long thing. 
The legal strategy is simply to uh, uh, lobby all our legislators uh, in every state now because uh, Roe Wade was, was struck down. So we have the opportunity to persuade state legislatures uh, to, uh, what's the word, restrict abortion as much as possible. What is feasible in a pluralistic polity where a majority of people do not agree uh, with uh, across the board uh, restrictions. So yes, uh, as the question suggests, it is a trade-off and we have to do our best to make our voices heard, but uh, we really don't have the power, uh, even if Catholics were, uh, you know, were 23% of the population, even if we spoke with a unified voice, we would be outvoted anyway. So we need to build a pro-life constituency and that's gonna take time. Again, the cultural strategy, we can't force the issue. We, we have to um, uh, learn to live with an imperfect situation as long as we're working towards the changing of hearts and the conversion of hearts and minds towards pro-life positions. Okay, thank you. Um, can you summarize the 1981 on human workbook by a former pope? Sure. And that pope was John Paul II. And okay. um, I, one thing I'll say about it, I'm reaching for my copy here, it's buried here. One thing I'll say about it is, of all the encyclicals, it's probably the hardest one to read. It's not the longest, oh. but it's hard. And here's my copy. It's hard because John Paul II was a philosophy professor, and he actually wrote a book in Polish in the uh, 60s called The Acting Person. I can't pronounce it in Polish, but uh, the original Polish. And it's th and this book, uh, this encyclical draws from his philosophical book. And so it's full of philosophical language. It's uh, like a jawbreaker language, even the translation into English, it makes it very, it's more like a philosophy book than anything else. But the basic thrust of that encyclical, so it's called On Human, uh, on Human Work, and it's uh, laborem exercens in Latin. It holds up the dignity of labor. It says that work is good for us. It's not drudgery. It's not just a uh, pain. And it's not just the means to an end of a, a paycheck. It can be good for our spirits, our souls, our creativity. The workplace is where we apply our skills, our brains, our creativity. Uh, and so the problem is that the workplace has become a place of humiliation for many, work, possibly the majority of workers, because workers are not given the opportunity to express themselves. Uh, for example, to trade off jobs every, you know, what do they call that work sharing or rotation, job rotation, mm -hmm. to learn all facets. If you work in a factory, why not just not be the guy that screws in one light bulb of a GM assembly plant, why not be given the opportunity to work on a rotation, all parts? If you're in academia like I am, maybe you should teach different courses, not the same old ones, so you don't get stultified. So John Paul II hints at some of these in much more philosophical language, but he wants to point towards the end of work, which is the development of each person. Yes, supporting our livelihoods, raising a family with the paychecks you get, but work can also be an end in itself, good creative work where you're paid well, where you're uh, protected from injuries and uh, environmental hazards. Uh, so it's holding up the value of human work as something that is good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, colonialism and economic development seem at odds with the origins of Jesus, the reasons why he became who he was in opposition of the leading culture of Judaism in his day. How has this become a key theme of Catholic social teaching? Yeah, I would invite you to see, I mean, there are tensions there, but I would invite uh, anyone uh, thinking about, you know, it's very obvious, Jesus started as an itinerant preacher. He never seemed to have any money. He was, he, mm -hmm. you know, he was itinerant. He didn't have any place. What did he say? The son of man has no place to lay his head which is not a very practical way of um, providing what, for a family or for long-term uh, uh, really anything. So after Jesus's uh, death and resurrection uh, and ascension, the church became an institution and of course started having property. You need some space to hold your worship services. It took some money to pay for the missionaries to spread the gospel. So yes, the itinerant and uh, very simple life of Jesus became complicated when the church became an institution. Uh, and of course, 
an institution can be morally upright and everything. The problem became when the principles were compromised, when Christian uh, uh, leaders like popes and bishops started working hand in hand with the kings, especially of Western Europe. First, the emperors, by the way, in the late Roman Empire, then the Holy Roman em emperors, uh, think of um, uh, who, who I think of Charlemagne and the popes, and then the Holy Roman emperors, uh, uh, Germany, Italy, Switzerland, that, uh, France, that part of Europe. So when politics and religion started getting merged together, we started getting uh, what's called Caesaropapism. The Caesar, the secular right. government, the kings, and the, pape, the popes were working together. By the way, that supported the horrors of the Crusades. The church preached, oh, let's go and attack the Muslims who occupy the Holy Land. On their way, they sacked Constantinople, the Eastern Orthodox Christians. They killed most of the Jews they could get their hands on. So most horrible things were the Crusades of the Middle Ages from about 1095 till about 1250. And that was an instance where religious leaders like popes and bishops worked hand in hand with political leaders like the kings of Europe, uh, uh, kings of uh, France and the, the uh, Holy Roman Emperor and caused great destruction. And then of course, the, the colonialism era after Columbus was further examples of that. Uh, the, uh, so obviously colonialism was bad. The church's complicity in it is regrettable. Uh, but the word, the phrase economic development, I'm going to defend because uh, people all over the world do benefit when technology is spread, knowledge is spread, more efficient uh, means of production are spread, where every country can produce some of their own manufactured goods. So that in itself is not a bad thing. It's only when the economic globalization becomes exploitative and doesn't benefit everybody. We need checks on globalization. We need to tame both the technology and the economic uh, processes that will spread the benefits of markets to all people. Good, good question. And this is a follow on, or maybe it's the same thing. Would you say that, <clears throat> excuse me, would you say that the church condones colonialism as a ways and means of achieving progress? Well, well, no longer, no longer. No longer. So the uh, beginning of the colonial era, so Columbus in 1492, mm -hmm. his second ship had missionaries because they discovered, oh, look, there's people here, we can convert them. Um, but soon it became not just converting, but exploitative, murderous. Uh, the, in, the Native Americans in all parts of the New World were rounded up, and as you know, in, our country, in the United States territory, put on reservations, they were robbed of their land, their heritage, their culture. So uh, many bad things about colonialism um, and the church's complicity in it. But I would still, st there's still a place for evangelization as long as it is free evangelization, not forcing people at the point of a gun, back then an arrow probably, uh, forcing people. One of my heroes, by the way, and this ties in very closely here, is the great 17th century Jesuit named St. Peter Claver. His feast was just September 9th, about 10 days ago, right? Exactly, 10 days ago. He was a Spanish Jesuit who went to Cartagena, that's in modern day Colombia, it was a Spanish empire back then, which was a slave port. So he would minister to the arriving African slaves as they were still in the ships and as they got off the ships, they were sent to a slave market, they were auctioned off. He accompanied them, uh, he brought them you know, food and uh, uh, what else, uh, medical care as much as he could. And he would give them instruction and would baptize them and other sacraments, hear their confessions, et cetera. Hopefully, he, he baptized 300,000 people, plus or minus estimate. Hopefully, each of those people knew what they were being baptized, baptized mm -hmm. into. That's a responsible way of spreading the gospel, not, uh, you know, uh, uh, what's the word? forced baptisms of any sort. So yes, colonialism is a negative thing. It's about domination. It's about empires. We can't condone that. But if we can spread the faith through positive, charitable, very generous missionaries like Peter Claver, uh, uh, the best interpretation of his work, which I prefer, frankly, I think it's true, uh, then we're, we make some good things come, even from the bad things about the empire, Spanish empire, et cetera. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, this is just a comment. It says, well done, acknowledging the complicity of the past church actions. Bravo. Good. Can't ignore <laughs> then, that. Yeah. Would you please comment on nuclear deterrence? 
if I had more time, that would have been the very next topic I folded into my peace and disarmament. Here's a fascinating thing, and I'll just to review the Cold War. The United States developed the atomic bomb, and some of you saw the movie Oppenheimer. I saw it. Um, the Manhattan Project, 1945, the end of the of World War II, probably... I would say President Truman didn't seem to have any conscience about dropping bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and killing uh, a couple hundred thousand Japanese civilians. But anyway, the U.S. had the bomb and then the Soviets developed the bomb by the late uh, 40s, maybe into 1950. And now there's five long term countries that have long had the atomic or hydrogen bomb, U.S., Russia, former Soviet Union, China, Britain, and France. And then there's another five countries that in the last few decades have developed the bomb that probably includes Israel, probably includes, um, uh, who are the other ones? Uh, Iran, probably includes North Korea. And there's a couple, I think South Africa had it for a while uh, and maybe given up their program. So something like 10 countries have it. Oh, and so what was the good thing? If there's anything good about the atomic bomb, the good thing was that it was created a situation of stability called deterrence. Um, uh, we wouldn't use it against the Soviets because then they would retaliate against us. It was a lose-lose situation. Sometimes that was called mutually assured destruction. M-A-D, by the way, mad. It was mad, but it did keep the peace during this Cold War all the way to the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall in 89, fall of the Soviet Union in 91. Uh, but of course, the Soviets still have, uh, the Russians now, uh, the successor country, still has lots of nuclear weapons, and they're pointed at New York and Boston and Washington, and we have hundreds of nuclear weapons, actually a couple of thousand, pointed at places like Moscow and Vladivostok and St. Petersburg or other places in Russia. This is not acceptable. And Pope Francis has said time and time again that the mere possession of nuclear weapons, even if you never use it, even if you don't intend to use it, merely possessing them is sinful in some ways. In other words, to target civilians is unthinkable. And so to, in the in the U.S. Bishop's pastoral letter, Challenge of Peace, they reached this compromise in 1983. Okay, you can have it temporarily, but you have to be working to alleviate them from, to eliminate them from the world. Francis has gone even further in his last three or four years, saying merely possessing them is sinful. So what do you do about that? I, I'm not in favor of unilateral disarmament. Putin then would have a monopoly on nuclear weapons. That's not stable. So I, I want to listen to Pope Francis. I want to work with him uh, and his moral principles to create a world where nuclear weapons don't exist, don't need to exist, and where we can rely on peace and disarmament. But maybe we're not there yet. So most complicated issue, issue of all time, I think. So thanks for the question. Well, big big question. Um, two more questions. Are you okay? Two more. I'm doing well. Yeah. Okay. Joan wants to know: Have be spoken on civilian use of military weapons in the U.S. Um, all the mass killings? Well, um, you know, uh, our bishops. So you know, I, I'm going to restrict this to the United States because I really don't know anything that popes have said about or Universal Catholic Church teachings on kind of neighborhood violence or neighbor to neighbor violence, the streets of any given city. In the U.S., the United States bishops have had occasional statements deploring gun violence. Of course they do. It's horrible. Innocent people being killed cross in the crossfire, uh, which were unintended uh, uh, homicides. Uh, I live in the Bronx, one of the most dangerous uh, boroughs in New York, one of the most dangerous zip codes, I think, actually in the world. 10458, uh, where Fordham University is located. It's very dangerous. I don't go out at night very often. Um, so our bishops have spoken out. I mean, everyone knows that the bishops are against unrestricted um, use of arms. The hard question comes when the question is, do people have a right to hold these arms even if they never use them? So our Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, the right to bear arms, it shall not be infringed, it says, um, how do we interp interpret that? Are there common sense gun restrictions? Of course there are. Every state has some common sense gun restriction, but of course every state varies. I liked living in Massachusetts for over 20 years because it had some of the most restrictive gun uh, control um, 
uh, restrictions in the country. Um, you couldn't open carry, at least in the cities I was in, Boston and Cambridge. Um, other parts of the country that I travel to, uh, sometimes I go to St. Louis, Missouri to give talks or meet some Jesuits there at St. Louis University. And anyone could carry open, it scares me terribly. One person gets angry at you, is it, what if I stepped on somebody's toe on the way to, I don't know, a talk or something, and they got angry and they reached under their, into their coat and pulled out their gun, uh, sometimes you could see their holsters anyway, and just decided that I was expendable. So I really worry about that. The, the statistics are startling, blood chilling, how many young people, especially uh, uh, people of all, especially people of color who tend to live in neighborhoods that are more dangerous, I'm thinking of Chicago and New York than others. So uh, have our bishops led enough on this issue? I don't know, I would like to see even greater leadership. I think they have their words right, but maybe they don't say those words often enough. We need to restrict access to guns, especially those red flag laws that keep guns out of the hands of unstable people, drug addicts, etc. So I don't have a full answer to that question. The Catholic position is good. Maybe we need to say it even more often. Thanks. And this is more common. It's a perfect way to end. It says, um, there is such a plethora of reading matter I am consolidating with one uh, one uh, subscription to a magazine called Plow. It is a quarterly. Please keep your smiling face. It is an invitation to listen. Okay, good. And That's you from recall, an own, yeah. yeah. You may recall that I said um, the very first thing I said in the session one was. I like uh, teaching. I like teaching face to face for like two plus semesters. I had to teach over Zoom. Just in fact, I was sitting in this very chair with this very boring background mm -hmm. that you're seeing right now for over two semesters. And I hope that my enthusiasm uh, uh, communicates across the, uh, in the what's it called, the uh, blogosphere, the internet, uh, the uh, the uh, restrictions of Zoom technology. So I am delighted to hear that my smile is perhaps. Uh, contagious even over the Zoom. So thank you for your uh, vote of confidence there. Uh, well, it, uh, it, your smiling face has made a huge impression. All the comments that we heard after last week, but we all like we all felt like we're sitting in the living room with you, and it was very, um, very soothing and it, it very appealing. You were very you, you made everything warm. You made everything um, the the fact of asking questions was um, and very you made it very inviting. So that's always a gift. And, and they you're were great a gift. questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the gift of you. That concludes the questions. Yeah, thank you, Father Massaro. And I apologize for adding an extra syllable to your last name. In the no intro. problem. So I got that. And I'm, uh, and thanks for sharing your wisdom. I can certainly tell that you enjoy teaching as a, as a fellow teacher myself and my other hats. Um, I was particularly um, tickled with um, your discussion on the common good and balancing that with individual values. It's um, it's actually a, um, a, 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 a camp that I work in. I'm an environmentalist and I balance protective laws of our natural resources with what individuals would like to do. And so I just wanted to let you know that there are some of us out there that are on the ground working with individuals and that you, you know, the, the idea of avoiding two extremes, I'm often talking with individuals and, and practitioners that are on other sides of the, of the extremes and have always sort of worked to some sort of common, uh, some common area for those. So thanks for that, that resonated well with me. Um, I do wanna say, I also look forward possibly to have an, a future discussion on the new encyclical that's coming out on the environment. I really would like to hear your thoughts on those. So um, great insight. And then um, just for my last comments, I'm gonna, I picked up a new mantra today, um, listening. And that is not to impose, but to propose that I like the addition that you put on there with civility and modesty. So that rounds that out real well. So I'll be chanting that a little bit periodically just to remind me. So thank you. Um, in conclusion, I just would like to note that uh, this uh, third series will be held next Tuesday, September 26th at 7 p.m. It's also via and only by Zoom. Please note, you don't need to register. You will automatically receive the Zoom link that day before. 
and an hour before the session. Um, this session has been recorded and will be emailed to you later this week, and it's the same link. Uh, for more information on this and all other upcoming programs or to register, go to our website at glastonburyabbey.org and click on programs. Also, while you're there, be reminded that our programs, um, including this series, are provided free of charge and would not be possible without your support, both just attending and your comments, but also um, any contributions otherwise that you can um, do. When you visit our website, please find the click on the red donate button. We suggest $20. However, we will gladly accept whatever you can, you will allow. If you have already donated um, for this evening's program, thank you. Uh, thank you once again for being with us this evening, and we hope to see you again next week. Blessings to all. Stay safe, stay well, and let us pray for peace. Bye. Thank you.